Awesome. Well, thank you guys for joining us today. Um, kind of in the style, if y'all old school used to watch David Letterman, kind of the top 10 things that your vet office wish you knew. So I'm Jen Serling. Um, I am a credentialed technician. Um, I've been actually credentialed since the dawn of time, like for like almost, I think I hit my 32 years this year. Um, I've been working at App State for the last two years since we started the program and I am the assistant director. So I have a short kind of my short top 10 list. And then what I thought would be really um, advantageous for you guys is opening it up to questions and, and what advice can we give you? How can we help you guys kind of take the fear out of taking your animals to the vet um, and making it more of a positive experience? If you've got questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A little box at the bottom of your screen. And then after I get done my PowerPoint, um, I can then open that up and uh, answer any questions that you uh, guys might have. Um, this is my golden retriever Daffy who will be making um, a few special appearances in my PowerPoint because she's kind of amazing. All right, so top 10, number 10. Brr. All right, don't be afraid to ask questions. So really communication is the key. Coming in, you know, things when you go to the vet, things are crazy. The dog or the cat are nervous. There's other animals going on. You're worried about, you know, the bill and it's just, you know, it can be really chaotic. Coming in with a notebook, writing stuff down ahead of time, no one knows your animal better than you. We don't live with that animal 24-7. We don't necessarily know what's normal for them versus abnormal. So writing things down, writing down your concerns, having information ahead of time. Are you giving certain supplements at home? Um, what type of food are you feeding? Having all that information kind of at your fingertips and not going, oh my God, I don't remember as the dog's like pulling on you. Um, is really going to, to make your vet visit a little bit easier. There's also, there's no dumb questions. All right. It's it, we love talking to you guys. We love being able to help you and make things better, you know, for your pet and for yourself. We want it to be a good experience. So asking, you know, if you're concerned that your pet might be a little too thin or usually a little too a little too chunky, you know, asking if, if it's at the appropriate weight, letting us know, you know, if you're going to be traveling or moving, do you need any special vaccines or specific vaccines for what you're going to be doing? Is it an indoor cat versus an indoor outdoor cat? Those types of things can really help us kind of tailor what might be best for your animal. If you're feeding things besides dog or cat food, you know, asking, is it okay to do this? Again, we're not going to judge, but, but knowing kind of what types of things you're feeding in addition to their normal food, again, is going to help us create a better treatment plan. Again, like I said, no one knows your pet better than you, but asking, you know, why are they doing certain things? Are you noticing behavioral issues popping up? That could be an indication that there might be some health issues that we need to be concerned about. So knowing kind of what's going on at home really helps. Again, there's a lot going on. Asking for handouts is not a bad thing either. Um, you know, if we're going through and we go through a lot of stuff that to us, that's normal because we give that spiel day in and day out every single day for years on end. So to us, that's normal. But if you're you know, not sure of what's going on, please ask for clarification because sometimes we forget, you know, we just keep going and, and, you know, what, what's is routine for us is not routine for you. And sometimes we need to be reminded of that. So asking for handouts, what vaccines did my pet get? Cause I'm not going to remember 3.5 seconds from now asking about um, various types of medication that you're going, that we need to prescribe. So asking for handouts can also help make things a little Little bit easier. So number nine, be honest in your answers. Like I said, we do not judge. I promise you that we are not the police. We are not narcs, but we do need to know what's going on. Um, I can't tell you the number of times that I've had patients come in where they've eaten special brownies and Yes, the chocolate is a problem, but the special ingredient is also a problem, but we need to know that they're special brownies. Again, we don't care 
necessarily what you're doing at home, but we need to know what that pet might have ingested in order to treat the animal appropriately. So we so definitely don't don't be afraid to be honest with us. Again, we also, you know, I'm probably one of the worst culprits in regards to feeding people food to my golden retriever. Thank God she has a stomach of steel um, and doesn't have a whole lot of issues from it. And I will freely admit that we go to Starbucks every week. Um, in fact, today we're going to Starbucks because she gets a puppuccino. Um, she loves her puppuccino. So, you know, we're humans and and we are not perfect and, and we feed people food too. But, you know, again, talking to us about it, letting us know, you know, does your dog go to Starbucks every week because maybe they're getting a little too fluffy and maybe we want to cut back and and uh, not necessarily use that. Um, so, you know, again, letting us know everything that's going on is hugely, hugely important. Protect your pet when they're traveling, whether it be to the clinic or um, out uh, out and about. Um, this is going to probably be a very controversial statement and it might upset a few of you. Retractable leashes, we hate them. I'm sorry. I know some people love them. They're awful. They cause problems with the animal. They can cause problems with the human that's on the lead. I mean, it's, they're not great. Um, so if you can, if we can wean you away, if you take anything out of this, don't use retractable leashes. Okay. Um, yeah, they can break. I've seen dogs get away from them They because the, the leash is broken. They've gotten out, gotten hit by cars. I've seen people lose fingertips because as the leash is being retracted in, it can cause burns. They're not great. Um, the other thing is use proper carriers, um, particularly with cats um, or small dogs. When you're coming into the clinic, pillowcases are not a great carrier. You can get relatively cheap carriers for like less than 20 bucks on Amazon. You can get them used. I've seen them in like um, uh, Goodwill and various thrift stores. As long as they're in a good condition and you clean them out really well, you can get them for really dirt cheap. Um, but it's really the safest way to transport uh, your animals. Animals. Cats in particular, you don't want to be holding it in your hands as you're going through a parking lot or into the clinic as there's other dogs around. And it can just be, again, just a complete dumpster fire of chaos. And we don't want the cat getting away from you because if you've ever tried to hold a cat that wants to get away, it is not easy. And they have claws and they are like, like crazy feline ninjas and they will get away from you. And you don't want to end up losing your cat that way. If you can get a carrier also, that instead of having the front open, that you can open it up from the top, that's a lot easier for us as the staff to be able to get the animal out. It's usually um, less stressful on them too, because we're not having to completely take the carrier apart um, in order to get the cat out, nor do we have to reach in and try to drag them out. Nobody wants to do that either. When you um, go into the clinic, keeping your pet under control, again, there's a lot going on. You don't necessarily want um, your animals going up and sniffing other animals. There can be animals that are sick. They may not even necessarily know that they're sick. So they could be harboring something. You don't want to get your animal sick. We don't want to end up with dog fights in the clinic. We don't want a dog going and um, getting the cat nervous and sniffing the cat carrier and getting the cat upset. So really kind of keeping, keeping your pet close to you and not having them being able to kind of meander wherever they want um, uh, makes a big difference. When you're in the car using seat belts or carriers, um, you can um, you know strap the carriers in, but you can also, there's special um, seats like for small dogs, there's um, seat belt attachments that you can get for the larger dogs that, that clip them in so that if you do suddenly break that the dog's not going to go flying or the carrier's not going to go flying. Um, also, you don't want like anything of like that projectile as you're in the front seat trying to drive either because that's just a recipe for disaster. So number six is also, you know, shop around. You don't, you're not obligated. And I, and I, 
can't reiterate this enough. You're not obligated to buy medication from your veterinarian. You can absolutely ask for a prescription. You can go to a human pharmacy because we do have some of the drugs that we prescribe are available in human pharmacies, or there's the roughly the equivalent. You can ask for a prescription. You can go to Chewy, 800 Pet Meds. There's various sites that you can go to. Make sure it's a reputable site though. Don't go to like, you know, weird Canadian you know, rx dot whatever, you know, make sure that you're going to a specific reputable site that's licensed to sell the, the specific medications so that you know you're getting what you get. Cause there has been issues, particularly with like um, heartworm medications um, uh, and some of our parasitic controls, uh, uh, parasitic drugs, that it looks like it's the official drug and it's just packaged a little bit differently because you went to a not so reputable site um, and got not the thing that you were supposed to. Um, so just make sure um, that you're going to the correct one. And your vet can absolutely give you information as to what they recommend. I purchase, I don't get my my drugs from my vet. I actually will go to um, uh, Chewy and I buy her stuff on, on Chewy. So um, also be aware, um, look for reputable flea and tick products. A lot of the over the over the counter ones, the OTCs, like, like, what is it? Hertz hearts. Um, those can be actually really dangerous for the animals. They're really not great to use again, using ones from the reputable pharmaceutical companies. We strongly recommend also a lot of the ones that are um, used in dogs can be actually, um, lethal for cats if they get exposed to it. So again, which is why communication is hugely important. So talking to your vet, letting them know that you have, you know, two species in the house that can also potentially dictate what medications um, that you're giving, particularly topical ones. You absolutely can shop around to other clinics for different price quotes. Um, if you've got, you know, some sort of injury or illness going on and they're charging, you know, what you're concerned is going to be an exorbitant price, absolutely call around and say, hey, you know, my vet diagnosed my dog with XYZ. It needs to be hospitalized. It needs surgery. It needs whatever. You know, could you give me, you know, a potential price quote or, you know, offhand what, you know, what am I looking at? You might have to go in and, and and pay an office call so that they can see the animal, but you absolutely can shop around. There are certain times too that veterinary clinics offer specials. We have a dental month, which I believe is February. Um, but you know, if your dog doesn't need a dental, it's not an urgent matter and you can wait till they're running a special, you can totally do that as well. But also knowing both your emotional and your financial limits. So, you know, knowing, you know, you've got a 14 year old dog that's been diagnosed with, with cancer or needs, you know, a, a very difficult surgery. Do you necessarily want to, to put that animal through it? Do you have the financial means to put that animal through that? And that's okay. It's okay to say that I've got financial limits or that I know that my dog is, is nearing you know, the end of its lifespan. And I don't know if I want to put it through, you know, a specific treatment. And I think Rebecca is going to be doing, uh, doing one on palliative care um, a little bit later on. So she can talk more about that as well. Another important thing is, is finding the vet before you get the pet. And I made a rhyme, but you don't want to try to be shopping around. It's also because of the pandemic and, and shortages and staffing. Um, not all vets are seeing patients right away. Um, sometimes you can be looking at two to three months before you can even get an appointment. So finding veterinarians, ask your friends, go on to, you know, to Yelp and Nextdoor or Facebook and asking for recommendations on, on clinics is a really good idea before you, you necessarily need, need that uh, veterinarian. So there's my dog. So when she was a puppy, she was a very bad, bad puppy. So in a two week time span, she ate a pan and a half of chocolate brownies, regular chocolate brownies, not special chocolate brownies though. Um, and I had to take her to the ER. Um, chocolate can cause some cardiac issues as well as some GI upset. So I needed to take her into the, to the ER and have her monitored for that. And then I kid you not, like a week later, she counter served and she ate an entire pepperoni pizza off the counter. Um, and then we had to induce vomiting and she 
she was really not happy about that. It was not as much fun going out as it was going in. Um, so I invested in pet insurance actually when she was a puppy. Um, when I got her at seven weeks of age, I did get pet insurance um, because I knew she was a golden. I know that they are notorious for eating things that they're not supposed to, but they're also, they have a higher rate of cancer. Um, and while I wasn't as worried about that early on with her, I knew as she aged, I wanted to, to make sure that if she did need treatment and if it was a treatment that I, I wanted to do, I wanted to make sure that I had pet insurance for her. And there's, there's a ton available. And even it used to be very specific um, insurance companies that were specific for pet, but now even I think nationwide and farmers, and you can go to, you know, even, you know, use for your car, your house insurance. And a lot of those have pet policies as well. And they're not horrifically expensive. I think mine started out when she was a puppy. I think it was like 40 bucks a month. She's now nine. So it's costing me about a hundred bucks a month, but it's still worth it. You know, again, you're looking at, at, you know, potentially, and while we're cheaper than, than in human medicine, you know, if she needed like a, a CAT scan or an MRI or, you know, chemo or, you know, a major surgery, you're looking at, you know, potentially thousands upon thousands of dollars that you don't necessarily, you might not have, or you don't want to put it on your credit card, but pet insurance can kind of defray the cost of that a little bit. Um, and so I really push with everybody. Um, I really push pet insurance because I do think it's worth it. Um, when they develop um, issues. Getting it earlier is also better because they will ask for pre-existing issues. So as you, as you, if you get them before, she's also got allergy issues. She's allergic to like everything under the sun. So she gets medication for that as well. Um, and because I had her policy before she developed the allergies, it'll cover stuff for the allergies. So you also want to get it before you, they develop any type of uh, pre-existing. All right. One of my favorite ones, number four, is preparing them for the visit. We, I know it may be, you might not think this, we really actually want it to be a good visit. We don't like it when they come in, when they're scared and nervous and they're, you know, either just, you know, cowering or, you know, they're acting out aggressively because they don't understand what's going on. And we really want to try to make visits as smooth as possible. One of the biggest things you can do is when you get a young, uh, young puppy or a young kitten working on simple tasks with them while they're um, babies makes a big difference when and they actually then go into the clinics. So messing with their feet, squeezing their paws, messing around with their toenails, picking up their ears and messing with their ears, lifting up their lips, looking in their mouth, you know, touching them and just really getting them used to, you know, uh, what will happen during a physical exam or various treatments that will need. I can't tell you, nail trims are probably the biggest ones that a lot of dogs really hate um, because they weren't worked with as puppies. And again, it makes a big, huge difference. It's not going to completely solve the issue. Again, using my dog as an example, and I worked with her religiously as a puppy and doing nail trims, and she still acts like, I'm killing her when I try to trim her nails. So what I do is I take a big old chunk of peanut butter and I smear it on my floor. And so she laps up the peanut butter as I'm trimming her nails. So it helps. It's not a hundred percent, but it makes it a lot easier um, than me having to MacGyver and to like pin her down and trim her nails because we really don't want to do that. A lot of vets are, are very amenable to having you come in for, for a happy visit or a fun visit where we don't do anything to them. They just come in, they get a cookie, they step on the weight scale, they smell the clinic, they see what it's like. They're just coming in. We're not doing anything to them. You know, they get their treat and then they go home. Um, so it's not, they're not associating every time they come into the clinic, they're not associating it with um, something that's, you know, something bad is going to happen to them. My dog, when I take her to the vet, um, she gets peanut butter and she's allergic to chicken. So she can't get dog treats, but she gets peanut butter. They have a big jar of peanut butter. And so every time she goes in, she gets peanut butter. So she thinks the vet is like the greatest experience ever. Um, she loves going because she's very food motivated because she's a golden retriever. So making the car rides fun and again, not just taking them to the vet, taking them, you know, if you like going to the dog park and your dog is vaccinated, you know, going out to the dog park, going to a special area, um, you know, to let them, you know, run around or take them for a special walk 
up to the mountains, you know, various places to Starbucks, you know, wherever you want, but make, make them enjoy the car ride. So they're not just every time that they get into the car, again, they're not associating it with something bad happening and using that positive reinforcement. So making, you know, making that positive association that, oh, if I go into the car, I'm going to get peanut butter, or I'm going to go get, you know, a puppuccino or whatever I'm going, you know, I'm going to PetSmart and I get a new toy, you know, again, just making them know that every car ride can be fun. I highly recommend looking for clinics that use fear-free philosophy um, for pet owners. You can go to fearfreehappyhomes.com. Their main website is fearfreepets.com. But fear-free is this huge, huge movement that started probably in about the last 10 to 15 ish years, but it's really gained a lot of momentum um, in the last 10 years or so. And it, and it goes along with that. We want things to be positive when pets come into the clinic. We don't want it to be a bad experience. We want happy patients. It's better for them. It's better for the staff. It's better for the owner. It's just an all around better experience for everybody. Um, and um, Fear Free's website has some great tips for pet owners to use, but you can also look for um, clinics for veterinarians and for veterinary technicians that are certified in fear free. Most of um, our faculty here um, have at least level one fear free. Some of them are actually elite fear free, which is like kind of the upper echelon. Um, so I highly recommend um, going to, to their website and checking them out because they're amazing. Um, one of the things that Fear Free um, is okay is, you know, recommends is if we can't, you know, kind of bribe them with peanut butter and, and treats is drugs are actually okay. It's all right if we need to sedate your animal and gate kind of, you know, take some of that anxiety out of them beforehand. That's not a bad thing. Drugs are, drugs are good. You know, I know that goes against what we learned as kids where they're like, just say no to drugs, but no, drugs are actually a good thing. Um, and and it does, you know, help alleviate that anxiety. It keeps, takes the edge off of them, keeps them calm. Um, and we will a lot of times recommend if, if, you know, they've gone into a clinic and just had a horrific experience, you know, it's okay to talk to your vet again, communication and say, Hey, last time I took him in, he was upset. He expressed his anal glands all over. It was just a hot mess. Maybe we can prescribe something so that before I bring him in an hour before I bring him in, I can give him this medication and he's not quite as is upset. Um, similar to um, taking them into um, a, you know, getting them in the car, not just to the vet, but also bring out the carrier, like with the, your cats or your small dogs, um, getting them used to the carrier before the trip, um, having the carrier out, put food in it, put treats in it, have a special blanket that they um, that smells good. There's also certain pheromone sprays that you can get that's kind of, it's like lavender, it just chills them out and you can spray that on them, but having them used to that carrier so that again, they're not like, you know, putting all four feet out going, no, don't push me in it. You know, so having them used to it really makes a big difference. So also making sure that you provide enrichment for your pets, because again, it's going to make them happier and healthier. Um, it's going to uh, have less issues with behavioral problems, but they need, you know, they need not just exercise. So yes, we, you absolutely need to exercise your pets, just like we need to exercise, but we want to get them um uh, with enrichment activities. So taking them for a walk and letting them smell, you know, the, the roses and, and, you know, sniffing the bushes that the, another dog peed in, you know, so various activities that keep their mind busy. PetSmart is great. Um, they have, in fact, I bought it for, for DAF, um, but they have various um, toys. They have like snuffle mats or they have toys that you can put small treats in and then they have to work at it to get the treats out. And that just, man, it keeps their mind going. And that enrichment makes a huge, huge difference with them. Um, for cats getting scratching posts, cause you know, wanting to kind of mimic their natural uh, behavior. So giving scratching posts, my cat, um, um, he has a windowsill that looks out into the front of our, our neighborhood so he can watch like people walking. He can look at birds that are landing out there, you know, again, stuff to, to keep them happy. 
If you do have pets with behavioral issues, it's know that it's not going to be an instant fix. Um, behavioral issues with animals take a lot of time and a lot of work. It's not just a pill that we can give and presto bango, they're good, you know, the next day. It takes months, if not years, to fix behavioral problems. And sometimes they're not fixable. Um, behavioral problems are usually the number one reason that dogs are dogs and cats are abandoned. So again, communication talking to your vet tech, talking to your veterinarian. If you're seeing any potential problems, we can help. There's also specialists. There's vet tech specialists in behavior. There's special veterinarians in behavior. There's various trainers that we can recommend. So there's stuff that we can do, but also realize it's going to take a lot of time and effort on everybody's part. And it's definitely going to be a team, uh, a team effort. Also, regular uh, preventative health visits are important because it can really kind of help thwart any potential um, issues that, that might be brewing. Um, so, you know, having, you know, pro the proper uh, vaccinations, um, making sure that you're vaccinating them on a regular basis and vaccinations that they, they necessarily need. Parasite control. Dogs need heartworm medication. Here in Arizona, we used to not have heartworm um, and we would only prescribe it if the animals were um, we're going to the East Coast or places that have heartworm, and now heartworm is everywhere. So dogs all over the place need to be uh, prescribed heartworm. Um, I've had <laughs> we've had clients go, well, my dog only goes outside, you know, to poop or pee, and we live in a gated community, so I don't think he needs heartworm. Yeah, he needs heartworm. Any place you've got mosquitoes, you're going to run the risk of getting heartworm. So again, talking to the veterinarian and the vet tech, if that's a concern, they need to be treated. There's internal parasites that they can get. There's external parasites. Um, and we can uh, use prevention for that as well. And again, that can and uh, can, can potentially um, eliminate uh, future issues with um, those. Spain and neutering, we all know um, spain and neutering can, uh, and uh, altering your animal can reduce the uh, likelihood of them developing certain reproductive cancers later in life. So that makes a big difference. So we uh, recommend that. Um, there is a movement right now, um, particularly for the larger breed dogs to hold off on spain and neutering until you give a chance to let, uh, let the bones develop. And again, talking to to your veterinary healthcare team, you guys can make an informed decision on when it would be best to alter your animal. Dental care is, is huge. Um, they need dental care just like we do. So we need to be checking their teeth. Um, I can guarantee you at some point in their life, they're going to need some sort of dental cleaning. And so again, talking to the healthcare team about that and um, when you're going to need to do that. But there's also prevention you can do with that. You can go and you can get doggy toothpaste and doggy toothbrush and you can brush their teeth. And that's going to reduce the um, amount of plaque and tartar buildup so that maybe you can put push off that expensive dental until, you know, a year or two from now. Microchipping is also hugely important. Um, usually only about 14% uh, of dogs that are not chipped end up finding their way home. So microchipping and then making sure that with the company that is that you microchip with, making sure that your information is up to date. Um, we'll have animals come in and we'll scan them and we'll get them because we have special scanners that we can identify it. We can then call the company and we can say, hey, we have an animal in here. It's microchip number, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Can you give us the owner's information? And I can't tell you the number of times that their num phone numbers have been um, uh, out of order. It's a previous owner, the animals changed owners. So, you know, keeping all of that up to date is hugely important so that if your animal does get lost, we can absolutely track you down and we can get him back home. Um, keeping their weight under control also is a big deal. Um, as animals, just like people, as we start to gain a little bit of weight, you can also have health problems associated with that. So again, talking to us about how can we, you know, maybe get the weight down so they're not quite as fluffy, but, you know, keeping that weight um, to a, a, a healthy number is really a good idea. As they get older too, and the joints aren't working quite as well, keeping them, you know, on a, on a lighter, uh, a lighter weight number is also going to help with movement with them as well. 
And then recognizing the veterinary healthcare team. So a lot of people go in and they're assuming that the veterinarian is doing everything. And that's not the case. The veterinarian, they're amazing. And they're going to go in and they're going to diagnose that animal. They're going to give the treatment plan to the technicians. And then we are going to then institute that treatment plan. We're going to be the ones taking the x-rays, running anesthesia, drawing blood, placing catheters, administering medications and injections. We're going to be the ones doing that to your pet. So realizing that there's a whole healthcare team involved in taking care of your animal. It's not just the veterinarian. When you go into a new clinic, also ask about credentialed vet techs. A lot of people don't realize that it's not mandatory depending on what state you're in. It's not mandatory for the veterinary assistant or veterinary technician that's taking care of your animals to be credentialed. So asking if they've got those letters behind their name is going to make a big deal when it comes to treating your animals. Um, I'm also a huge proponent of um, if they've got students there um, or if they have non-credentialed uh, veterinary assistants, a lot of uh, places will use those staff members they'll train them on animals, um, on your, on your pet. So it's okay to ask and say, Hey, you know, I'm okay. If you, you know, if your student would like to draw blood on my, you know, practice drawing blood on my dog, but make sure again, that communication so that your dog or your cats not necessarily being used for training unless you want it to be. So that was my top 10 and I couldn't really necessarily, limit it to 10. So I did want to put out some kind of what I'm calling my honorable mentions um, that I thought is just important to know. So finishing all the meds as directed, particularly antibiotics, because we have a lot of issues with various bacteria that are antibiotic resistant. So making sure that you finish all the meds as directed um, reading the label on the bottle. If you're not sure if your pet's having, you know, a reaction to it, if you just don't think that they're doing well on the medication, again, talk to the veterinarian, talk to the credentialed vet tech and let them know what's going on. And we may say, okay, you know, we need to stop or we need to switch medications, but, but definitely talk to us before you're like, nope, not working, peace out, not giving it anymore. Um, don't give human meds um, unless directed by your veterinarian. Again, there are some that can be given to both animals and humans, but there's also some that are extremely toxic to animals and can actually be fatal. A lot of our over-the-counter pain control um, drugs, such as your Advil, your Tylenol, can be lethal to animals. So please, 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 even if they're limping, talk to your vet. Don't just say, oh, you know what? This worked great for me when I pulled my back. Let's give it to Fluffy. Please don't do that. It's also better to call and have it be nothing. Again, we would much rather have you call and have it be something minor that we can deal with over the phone than having it be some sort of catastrophic um, issue. So please don't hesitate to call us. That is what we're here for. Kind of on that same note, Google's fabulous, but it's also not going to replace us. You can get some great information on the internet, but please don't use it to develop your own treatment plan for your pet talk to us. All right. That's what we're here for. Also, there's a lot of unreliable sites that you can go to. Um, you've got kind of your armchair warriors that think they know a lot about veterinary medicine and they can give some really bad advice on there. Um, so talking to your veterinary healthcare team, going to your vet's website. And a lot of those um, facilities will have links of sites that are reputable that you can then go to get information. Like if your dog is diagnosed with hypothyroid, um, don't just go, you know, what do I do if my dog has hypothyroid? And then you're going to get all of these hits about, oh, well, here's these great all natural medications that you can give. You don't need to give it any type of form. Don't do that. Just talk to us. Um, also, again, call early. Don't wait for small issues to become larger ones. Um, you know, again, small things we can we can you know hopefully fix relatively you know quickly and easily and less expensively before it starts to blow up and become a huge issue. So don't again, don't hesitate. It's better to call and have it be something small or nothing at all than it be a huge, huge, big deal. And I had to end it with my amazing dog. So let me stop sharing because it looks like there might be some questions. 
Well, Jen, thank you for this uh, presentation. And I was just going to interject a question. Um, for people in the session, there's a Q&A button. If you click that, you can type in your question. And and what I was going to ask you, uh, Jen, you've met um, our dog Tremont. Yes. And um, a few years ago, Tremont, you know, just seemed to lose steam and we took him to the vet. Turned out uh, he had Lyme disease and I had never heard of a Lyme vaccine before. But for those of us who are in the high country, ticks are real. And yeah. so this can happen. So is this a more common vaccine now? It's, you know, it depends on where you're located again. So I'm here in Arizona where we have other tick borne illnesses, um, that we need to, that we'll, they're not actually most of the ones out here we don't have a vaccine for yet, but they're working on it. But Lyme disease is one that they've developed a vaccine for. But again, a lot of the diseases are are kind of geographical. So again, that's why talking to us and letting us know, like if I was then, you know, moving from Tucson, Arizona to Boone, North Carolina, I need to let my vet know that I might want to vaccinate DAF for Lyme disease, or I might need a different type of, of tick medication because I'm going to where there's completely different species of ticks versus what we've got here in Arizona. I thought I might also ask you about pet insurance, because I, I know different people have asked about that. Are there reputable places to go? Because you mentioned with prescriptions, not all places are the same. I imagine the same is true with pet insurance. So are there some tips on reliable sources to go for info? So yeah, you know, and again, you can Google it and you'll kind of get, you know, different you know, different opinions on, on various, I think, you know, any of like the big, the big insurance companies, what farmers and progressive and, and state farm and all of those, you know, those are going to be good. I've got mine and this is not a plug whatsoever. I do mine through healthy pause. It was just one that I've been familiar with for years and years. And so to me, it was just, well, I know I've used healthy pause in the past. This is what I'm going to get. So that's the one I did, but there's, there's several, several out there, um, you know, just kind of, you know, shop around, you can ask other pet owners, you can ask your vet clinic, what they recommend. Um, you know, they'll give you some good advice as to, you know, typical ones that they see. There's also some that will um, uh, make you pay and then they'll reimburse you ahead of time. There's other ones that you can actually submit the claim to the to the veterinary clinic and they'll pay so you're not necessarily paying as much out of pocket. So there's there's various um, various ways to look at it. Um, question is, is what if my vet's office wants to take our dog into the back room instead of doing things in the examination room? I prefer to be with the dog. Is it okay to request things to be done with me present as long as it's possible to do the procedures in the room? Absolutely. There are some things that legality wise and, and safety wise, we can't necessarily let you come to the back. Like for x-rays, um, for example, you've got, there's PPE and stuff involved in it. So you can't necessarily be with your dog as we're taking an x-ray, but you absolutely absolutely um, can say, hey, you know, I would prefer that he stay here. We can, we are so capable of drawing blood and, and doing things in an examination room, but it's also okay, you know, if the dog needs to be, if the animal needs to be brought back, but it's okay. It's absolutely okay to ask that. Other questions? I've got another question, Jen. Oh, good. I like questions. Because <laughs> the dental is a big thing and, um, you know, kind of timing out sometimes for a pet. When is the best time to get a dental visit since they're going under? So um, are you aware, like I've seen, you know, when you start going through those sites like Chewy.com and stuff, <laughs> in addition to like the toothbrush, they have like dental wipes and different things. So is is brushing best or like those dental wipes? Is that... Good. The dental wipes are good and they've got special components on them that help, you know, break down, um, break down the plaque and, and they're not going to, it's not a cure-all for having a, a dental procedure. I mean, I can brush my teeth, you know, four times a day. I still need to go to the dentist and get my teeth scraped. And it's the same thing with these guys. I will say 
this is another one where doing things earlier can be save you money on the long run. Cause if you wait to where, you know, their breath stinks and they've got just like you, and you know, you look at the dogs that have just like horror gross chunks of tartar all over the place. And, and, you know, their breath smells like something crawled in there and died. That's going to be a much more expensive dental procedure. They might need extractions, but if you're doing it, you know, routine dental cleaning every one or two years, it's going to help on the long long run, keeping that mouth healthy and healthy mouths are also, you know, they can help prevent other diseases going on because you're keeping the bacteria and you're keeping that mouth clean. So it helps with other parts of the body as well. But yeah, even, you know, as when they're young, brushing the teeth, using the dental wipes, all of that can kind of prolong that, that dental procedure, which like you said, are not cheap. You guys have got to have more questions than this. Either I was that thorough or I put people to sleep. <laughs> Dog has always had terrible breath ideas. So there are several chews out there that you can give to help. Um, Bad breath, though, can also be indicative of some health issues. So letting the vet know and saying, hey, you know, again, his mouth smells like a sewer, you know, doing some blood work and making sure that there's not, you know, potentially, you know, in, uh, internal issues going on that can manifest in bad breath is definitely a good thing. But there is, you know, some oral stuff that we can give to kind of help mitigate that. And then there's some dogs that they just don't have great breath. Hopefully he's not one of those, though. But yeah, definitely talk to the vet. Um, what are some less than obvious symptoms or behaviors that indicate I should schedule a vet visit? So the big ones obviously would be, um, you know, any type of deviation from their activities, uh, looking at, you know, are they eating and drinking normally? Are they drinking more than normal? Uh, cause that can be a problem. Um, if they're e eating less food, they're still eating, but they're just not as enthusiastic. Like I know if my dog stops eating, there is something catastrophic going on with her because that dog lives for food. But, but even, you know, if she just isn't finishing out her, her food as quickly as possible, that can be kind of a subtle indication that things might start, you know, kind of going south, looking at their, um, their behavior. Did they used to jump on, on the bed and now they're either slow to get on the bed or they just seem to be struggling a little bit. Are they just not quite as active as they used to be? Um, are they, you know, uh, uh, differences in, in what are they, you know, what were they doing before? Like, was they always playing with toys and now they have a disinterest towards it? So again, you are the best one to know what your animal does at home. And so again, you can pick up on those subtle things a lot, um, a lot easier than we do, but yeah, um, those are some stuff that you can look at that might not be, oh my God, they stopped eating. It's like, oh, well, they're just not as enthusiastic as they were before. Um, what are some of the best dog foods that aren't really expensive, but good? We have, oh my gosh, you have 11 dogs feeding them dog chow, but they had a shortage of it. So I changed them over to kibbles and bits. So, you know, I know Anne gave her and, and she's a VTS in nutrition and she's phenomenal. Um, looking at, uh, the, um, AFCO, the AAF, uh, CO looking at, um, Purina, I will admit Purina is one of the better ones and they have both their high end and they have, you know, the lower end, but they do the feeding trials. They're making sure that everything is, is balanced. Um, so reading the labels and, and just making sure that, um, they're, um, that they're going through the proper channels, um, in testing their dog foods so that it's balanced. But Purina, I, I'm a huge, uh, plant, uh, proponent of Purina. That's a lot of peas. Um, one of my top 10 post COVID tips is to schedule your appointment in advance and having some grace with the veterinary team. Things are super busy right now. Yeah, they are. Thank you for that. Um, you know, there are shortages in both, um, with both veterinarians and credential technicians and, 
it seems like everybody and their uncle got pets during the pandemic and, and it's be, you know, show a little grace, you know, be a little bit. Okay. Um, if we can't get you in right away, scheduling it in advance, if you know, you know, two months from now, your dog is due or your cat's due for vaccinations, calling now and making the appointment so that you're not scrambling going, but he was due today. He needs his vaccines now. Um, you know, will help a lot with us. So Jen, I was going to ask about um, some dogs, cats are more sensitive and it seems like there's a rise in sort of mobile vets and what, how can you speak to that with mobile vets, uh, maybe some limitations or benefits to using them? There's, you know, really, honestly, there's not a lot of limitations. Um, and, and I did, I have worked with mobile vets in the past. Um, a lot of the facilities that they have now, they're even better than they used to be. Um, they have a surgery suite in their, in their big, huge RV and they can do full service. They have x-rays that they can, you know, they can do radiographs. And, and again, it's, you're not necessarily having, particularly if you've got one that's nervous and that, and there are dogs and cats that hate going into the car. So having a mobile veterinarian, and I, that's a good point that I hadn't thought of to bring up, but having a veterinarian come to the house can decrease that stress um, even more. And there's, if you go on to fear free, there's also um, mobile veterinarians that are fear free certified. So when they come to the home, they're still using, you know, that same philosophy to try to, to mitigate the stress of the animal, but, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with with using mobile clinics and having them come to the house and they can do pretty much everything that um, if you were to go to a clinic and do, if it's like an invasive type of surgery, like an orthopedic type surgery, something major, obviously that needs to go into a clinic, but for, for routine general care, absolutely. You could, you could do that. Um, when it comes time to, for euthanasia, um, there's also, um, uh, practitioners that will come to your house and euthanize your pet in your, in the home. So again, they're in a familiar surroundings and it's just less stress on the animal. It's usually a lot less stress on the person because you're able, everybody's there. It can make it, you know, a really calming, beautiful experience. So that's another, another good reason to use them. Um, I'm scared to clip my dog's nails because I'm afraid that I'll cut them too short. Is there a way to know exactly where to clip or where not to? So yeah, so there's, um, and I will, this is the one time I'll say there are some good tips on the internet, but so there's a little blood vessel that runs in the nail um, of, of dogs and cats, and it's called the quick. And in light colored nails, um, you can see it because it'll be its little pink area on the nail. And so if you look at that, that's not, that's where you don't want to clip. They'll also let you know, because as you start clipping towards that quick, it's more painful. So they'll, they'll jerk, they'll react to that. If you do quick them and if they do start to bleed, it's okay. Um, get a, a, a septic pencil that like pe the guys use for shaving. Um, you can just, there's also a quick stop that you can get at the pet store and you just put the powder on there to stop the bleeding. Uh, a lot of times if you do cut them though, that again, it's a bad experience. And then they're reactive when you try to do it again after that. If you've got an animal with dark nails, um, doing small chunks at a time so that as you're starting to get closer to that quick, they're going to, they're going to react because they're going to feel it more. And then, you know, to stop. Um, also, if you've got dogs that um, have real long, uh, long quicks, and so that you can't cut their nails short, um, if you trim them more often, that quick will start to recede up to a point. So if you do a more, more uh, nail trimming more often, you can keep them a little bit shorter. Good question. And I did add the fear free handout on nail trimming. Uh, the fear free Beautiful. site has a lot of good, they offer free webinars and a lot of good information. Yeah, they're fabulous. Um, what I, like I said earlier, I do peanut butter. I just take a big old chunk of peanut butter and I smear it on my tile floor and then I let her lick it up as I trim her nails. Um, you do want to be careful if you do use peanut butter, make sure that you get the ones that don't have any type of artificial sweetener. Artificial sweeteners are toxic and they can be lethal for, um, for dogs. So you do want to make sure that you're using, it has to have the real stuff in it. 
Um, you don't, question is, is do you need to file nails? Not necessarily. They do. I know there was a big, huge push um, a couple of years back for those, um, uh, like the Dremel tools. I have found a lot of dogs hate it. They don't like the vibrations. They don't like the feel of it. You can do just a regular nail file. Um, so you absolutely can file them if you want. Just getting a good pair of, of nail trimmers, though, usually will do the trick. Um, if you are going to use like the Dremel tool, again, getting them used to it so that you, they're not just going, oh my God, what is this? You know, getting them used to it ahead of time. Love this. Yeah, Fear Free though, the Fear Free website is amazing for stuff. Um, and I'm always, you know, happy and and it really any of our faculty is, but I'm we're, I'm always happy to talk to you guys about pet questions. So don't ever hesitate to reach out to us because that's what we're here for. And we do archive these talks. So if some of you missed maybe Anne's talk about pet food or backyard chickens, which was also quite popular, uh, it is on our website. She is the guru of, of pet nutrition. So I would definitely refer you to, to her on that. Um, so another question is, is do we take care of exotic animals? So yes. So there are some, I would, again, you kind of want to look around, not all veterinarians will see exotics. So you want to, um, you want to check. Um, I've done some exotic work. We teach exotic animal medicine in our, um, in our program. Um, a lot of technicians, the credential technicians, there is a component of their schooling where they do learn about exotic animal care. Um, but there's usually specific veterinarians, um, particularly for like the little, like your mammals, some routine GPs will do like guinea pigs and stuff like that. But a lot of them, um, there's specific uh, animal veterinarians and, and uh, animal technicians um, and specific clinics. Cause there's, there's some different tools and, and, and ways that we take care of them that you don't always see in the GPs. Um, next question is, is most animals considered exotics besides cats and dogs? So cats and dogs are considered our companion animals. And again, that's, you know, 90% of, of what we all see. Exotic animals would be, would, uh, would be your, like your birds, your small mammals. So guinea pigs, um, gerbils, hamsters, chinchillas, daegus, and then you've got um, exotics such as your reptiles, your snakes, and your lizards, and all of that fun stuff. Um, there's also fish medicine, which is a whole nother thing that I don't know anything about, um, but there's also veterinarians and veterinary technicians that specialize in aquatic medicine. Um, so dogs and cats are kind of the general, and then exotics would be, would be considered those type. And then you have your large animal, which is your small ruminants, so your goats and your sheep, um, and then you've got uh, cattle, um, so production animal, and then equine. So there's a whole bunch. So we learn on so many different species. Great questions. Yeah, and so Rebecca's going to be on uh, November 10th. She'll be discussing uh, senior pet care, which is going to be a great one. Any last questions? Got a couple more minutes. Um, question is, so if I wanted to work with reptiles, I would have to find a vet that sees those correct. Yeah, you would. Most general practitioners are not doing reptiles. Um, again, it's, it's very specialized care. A lot of the equipment's different. Um, so typically with the, with those reptiles, there's going to be a specific veterinarian for it. So I would, you know, kind of look around, um, if that's someone that you were interested in, in doing, I would look for a vet that specifically does reptiles and you can find them. There's, um, there's a, um, a specialty reptile specialty for the veterinarians and you could um and i can't remember the name of it off the, the specialty off the top of my head but if you search reptile vets you'll get a whole a whole slew of them question is, is, does the vet tech program cover those things or what I need to have to take more courses so we do have um, some exotic animal courses 
um, where you do learn very basics on reptiles. We don't go into a whole ton on exotics because again, there's so much on dogs and cats that we need to cover, but we do cover exotics and reptiles, birds, small mammals, and all of that, as well as large animals. Um, and then we do have some advanced courses in our 4,000 um, that you can take in regards to lab animal or exotic animal. So there's, there's some, not a ton. And then you can, you know, again, go above and beyond once you graduate too. I think that might be it. Well, thank you everyone again for attending and thank you, Jan, for all the great information. This has been a lot of fun talking with you today. Yeah. Thanks you guys. This was great. I appreciate y'all coming. Have a fabulous weekend.